Good evening, and welcome to our Wednesday evening Bible study. Pleased to have you here, and welcome uh, to Newport News Church of Christ. And uh, hope that you trust and pray that your week has, has, has gone well thus far. Uh, well, everyone we have in the building is uh, doing well. And uh, so bring it down a little bit. We got a little feedback. There we go. All right. And so we uh, hope, trust, and pray that uh, that you've had a, a great week, and we're going to uh, delve back into our study. Uh, we're looking at the life of Elijah, one of the significant prophets. Um, I, I didn't say this last week. Elijah is one of the non-writing prophets, so he's a he's one of the he's a ma he's a, a major prophet, a major figure, but he's not a writing prophet. So that means there's not a book called the Book of Elijah, Elijah, Elisha. So he's one of that. Uh, so we have a, a group of writing prophets that like Isaiah, Jeremiah. Uh, the writing prophets, and we call them major prophets because of the size of their work, uh, Isaiah, Jeremiah, large size of their works, and then we have, and then uh, Daniel, then we have some of the minor prophets that are not minor in their uh, responsibility or in their uh, uh, import to the scriptures, but as far as minor, as far as their works are smaller. Um, and then we have a set of, of the non-writing prophets that did not write books, and so Elijah is certainly one of them, but certainly when you look at his life, um, you cannot doubt the, uh, the magnitude and impact that Elijah has on us uh, in his life and uh, what he means to us. All right, <laughs> Hope in the Cave, part two. Hope in the Cave, part two. I want to get back into our uh, study uh, of Hope in the Cave and uh, from our, our, the study of Elisha. And so this is taking place in the book of 1 Kings, uh, chapter 17, 18, is where we were at last week. I'll quickly recap some of that. And then uh, you kind of can put your finger on chapter 19, and uh, we'll be there in 19. So we look at uh, the kings of Israel and Judah. The book of 1 Kings traces the line of kings in the north from Jeroboam uh, through Ahab. Also the line of kings uh, from the south, from uh, Rehoboam after Solomon's death through Jehoshaphat. So we see these two storylines, the north and the southern kingdom, the north Israel, the south Judah. And we see both of those, those storylines kind of go, we kind of concentrate more up in the north with some fluctuations and some jumps down into the region that at the time of this was going on, this was the king down in the south. So you have a point of reference. All right. Some of Judah's kings in the south were good kings, and all of the kings in the north were bad kings. And, and good and bad is classified uh, on the basis of whether they promoted the, the worship of the true God. And so in uh, the north, in Israel, starting at Jeroboam number one, uh, they did not promote the worship of the true God. They diverted and, and uh, got the people's hearts away from the worship of true God. And as we'll talk about uh, what Jeroboam did and his efforts in Jeroboam, as we talked about last week, he is the, the, the archetype, he's the prototype that they mentioned when they say, and he did like his father Jeroboam. We point back to him. If you're gonna look at somebody in the dictionary as, as a sign of evil and doing evil, we look at Jeroboam. And so, uh, Good and bad is classified by whether the kings promoted the worship of the true God or whether they adopted idolatry. Our major uh, protagonists in the story, the ones that are against, that, that Elijah has to deal with, are Ahab and Jezebel. Ahab reigned over Israel for 22 years, and he did more uh, to provoke the Lord God of Israel or to anger uh, than all the kings of Israel that were before him. This is found in 1 Kings 16 and 33. So Jeroboam is bad, but Ahab, uh, as we kind of get Ahab, he's the pinnacle. He's going to do more to provoke the anger of the Lord and just their outright uh, uh, evilness against God and to, and to pull the people's hearts and minds away from the worship of the Almighty Jehovah. Married the wicked woman of Jezebel. Uh, a wicked woman named Jezebel. Together, they both served and worshiped Baal, the Canaanite storm god. Uh, Jezebel, she was dedicated to the worship of Baal and importing that worship and getting that worship into the life of the Israelites. Baal was the Phoenician fertility god who sent rain and bountiful crops, and the rites that were connected with his worship were unspeakable 
and immoral. Uh, these included child sacrifice and uh, deviant sexual practices uh, were all part of the worship of Baal. Jezebel was determined to spread the worship of Baal in Israel. Uh, Baal worship became the official religion of the royal court with hundreds of pagan uh, priests lived and dined in the palace precincts. We found in 1 Kings 18, 19. So she, she incorporated it. That made it the official religion. Uh, they had statues. Uh, Ahab erected statues and monuments to Baal within the royal court in Israel. So they, she made that the official religion. The faithful priests, now there were faithful priests and Levites who served the true and living God, but they left and went south into Judah, as we find in 2 Chronicles chapter 11, 13 through 16. So after the kingdom divided, there were still faithful priests in Israel. Uh, they were still God's people. They, were, they still understood the, the one true God, the God that had brought them out of Egypt and the God of their fathers, Isaac did. Uh, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, and their, their forefathers, they knew the lineage, they, they knew the history, and so, uh, but when the, the king and the queen Jezebel, they put this pagan worship in, uh, and then set up priests who were really not priests to be the priests for, for Baal, so the true worshipers of God, uh, those true uh, prophets, and, and those true priests and Levites who serve the true and living God, uh, they found it best for their fortunes to leave and to go down south where still uh, there was still some worship of God in uh, Judah. Elijah appears on the scene at this crucial time uh, in the northern kingdom of Israel when pagan worship was making inroads amongst God's people. So we find that we say that Elijah wasn't necessarily the polished preacher uh, that Jeremiah and Isaiah were, but uh, he is a reformer. He's one that's gonna cry out and decry against uh, pagan worship that was making inroads among God's people in the northern kingdom. Elijah's message. Jeroboam, the first king of Israel after the division, tried to change the religion in Israel from the worship of Jehovah God to the worship of Baal. And so when he did that, once the kingdom split and those 10 tribes followed him uh, in the north, he set idols of Baal at the villages of Dan and Bethel. He feared if the people to the northern, uh, the people of the northern tribes worshiped at Jerusalem in the south, the two kingdoms would once again unite. The people's heart would kind of be won back over to the worship of Jehovah, and they would end up uniting and coming back together and, and merging back together. So uh, in order to keep his kingdom, to keep his throne, he has to do everything to keep opposition between those two people set up worship, set up alternate sites, make easy religion so that they would not have to return back to Jerusalem. And so if you can, and so he had learned this, uh, uh, he had been exiled down in Egypt for a while. And so he learned down there that you can control people through religion. If you control their minds, control what they do, control what they see, you can wean people away and keep people where you want them to be, keep them thinking the things you want them to think and keep them from going back to what's true and what's right. And so Jeroboam did this, set up two cities in Dan and Bethel, put pagan uh, uh, idols there of Baal at those two villages. And so told the people, here, this is where you worship. You don't have to go down to Jerusalem anymore and worship down there. Even though they knew Jerusalem was the place, it was a necessary place, they would go down there to observe the festivals and feasts. He subverted that and kept them uh, up in the, in the north and put two alternate places for them to worship. Ahab saw no harm in participating. So now we get, uh, of course, we talked about that lineage last week of, of the, the descendants and how those uh, dynasties uh, fell. Uh, so we don't have a, a dynasty, a clear dynasty from Jeroboam. Uh, we have uh, Ahab, who's the son of, of Omri. And, and we, read, we talked last week about how he came to power. Ahab saw no harm in participating in the Canaanite religions. Remember, uh, the people had been brought back and they had to conquest in, in, uh, in Canaan. And so uh, they were supposed to drive out all the Canaanites. God didn't want them around those Canaanites, but unfortunately they allowed some of the Canaanites to remain in the land. And so unfortunately they got corrupted because then they began to adopt the religions and the practices of the people in the land and those Canaanite religions. And Ahab saw no harm in that. But God sent Elijah on the scene to confront the idolatry and immorality that Ahab and Jezebel 
who are promoting. So uh, Elijah is the reformer that's going to come on the scene to confront them and to let them know what God has to say. Elijah spoke out against evil without concern for his personal safety. His message to Ahab was there would be no dew or, or rain in Israel for several years. The New Testament lets us know that the famine lasted for three and a half years. We find that in Luke 4, 25. Then also uh, James reflects on that in 5, 17, where he says in Elijah that there was no uh, rain or dew in Israel for three and a half years. So we have two New Testament references that confirm for us uh, how long that rain was. We talked about last week, the autumn and spring rains along with the summer dew were necessary for crops. So you have the early rains in the fall, uh, in October and November, you have the latter rains in uh, March and April, and then during the summer where you don't have any rain, but in the morning there's dew on the ground. So that was vital for the crops. So uh, with uh, uh, Elijah coming, he stopped all precipitation, all moisture, no early rains, no latter rains, no dew in the summertime to do. And so, you know, even for us, we wake up and, and the, uh, uh, if you cut your grass late in the evening, by the time you get done, the grass is wet because your evening, you have the dew that builds up on your, on the ground in the evening time, early in the morning, you see the dew and the frost and the moisture on the ground. And then you have the rains, but God stopped it all. He stopped the latter rains, the early rains, the latter rains and no dew on the ground. So. Um, there was no way that they could, it, there's, uh, that without that moisture and precipitation, there was, uh, you could not uh, grow crops or germinate crops. Many years before in Deuteronomy chapter 11, 16 through 17, God has said that if his people do not obey him, he will withhold the rains and chastise them and the earth would not produce crops. So in, in Deuteronomy, uh, under Moses, Moses had told them, that there would be no rain. Let's go over and look at that real quick. Take a minute. Deuteronomy chapter 11. Deuteronomy chapter 11. Deuteronomy chapter 11, verse 16 and 17. Take heed to yourselves that your heart be not deceived and you turn aside and serve other gods and worship them. And then the Lord's wrath be kindled against you, and he shut up the heaven, that there be no rain, and that the land yield not her fruit, and lest ye perish quickly from off the good land which the Lord giveth you. So this is Moses in Deuteronomy talking as he's getting that generation, that new generation, that second generation, the old generation has died off. So he's preparing uh, in the second tale of giving of the law. He's preparing this new generation of young people who've grown up in the wilderness getting them ready to go in Canaan. So he said, don't be, don't turn away to other gods because you'll get kindle God's wrath against you. And then here's a prediction. Then I'll stop the rains from heaven. And without the rains from heaven, you don't get the fruit from the ground because if you don't do me right, then I'm not going to bless the earth. So we already had uh, that warning in Deuteronomy from uh, Moses. And so here is Elijah coming on the scene in King telling them, uh, because of your evil, because of what you're doing, there's not going to be any rain for several years. The, uh, so uh, Elijah's message was a challenge to their belief in Baal, uh, whom they believed to be the storm god. So now Baal is the storm god. Baal, they believe, is the one that brings a storm. So uh, in ancient times, ancient people, without, uh, without the knowledge of God, would assign different gods for the rain and for the sun and for fertility and for uh, crop reproduction. So they worshiped all these false gods instead of saying it was Jehovah, the one true God who says, the Bible says, who makes the sun to shine, who, who makes the sun to set, who uh, does all of these things, the creator of the universe, man in his own ignorance ascribed all these different things. Oh, we got a God for this and we got a God that does that and a God for fertility. And so they have all these rights and sacrifices to sacrifice to appease if it's not raining we got to appease the rain god if it's not if we don't get fertility or or the crops we got to sacrifice to this god so all of these things man would do believing that they are the reason for these natural ecological processes in the earth but instead of recognizing as paul said they being ignorant of god's righteousness went about their own righteousness in uh first corinth uh, in uh, romans chapter one 
talking about all those natural things that are clearly seen that they uh, would not retain God in their knowledge and being ignorant of God, uh, willfully being ignorant. So uh, Elijah's message is to challenge their belief in Baal, whom they believe to be the storm God. And, uh, and uh, so uh, Elijah is basically saying, okay, we're going to show you who controls the weather. We're going to show you, you, you believe in Baal, who you think is the storm God. Elijah said, okay, uh, it's not going to rain for about, a, for about three years. So you just deal with that. Elijah, as soon as he comes on the scene, just as quickly as he comes on the scene, Elijah is told to leave. Once Elijah delivered that message, uh, that is back in uh, uh, 1 Kings uh, 18, 18, if you're looking, 18, uh, we'll see, uh, no, that's in, uh, first, excuse me, uh, uh, 17, in Kings 17, beginning of Kings 17, just as soon as Elijah comes on the scene, delivers that message about there not being a rain, uh, God ordered him to hide. The message infuriated King Ahab, and it was not safe to, for Elijah to remain in Samaria. He he needed to be gone because this king made this uh, uh you know made it uh, Ahab mad that their god that they believed in, who they being the storm god, could not bring them rain. And Elijah had came in, so Elijah immediately becomes the troublemaker in Israel because he came and proclaimed this message, and then of course it came true, and there was no rain. As we mentioned last week, Elijah hid in a ravine east of the Jordan River uh, by the brook uh, Ch uh, Kittereth in Israel. It is called uh, and so this brook is on the other side of the Jordan. So, you know, we see Samaria, you have the Sea of Galilee, you've got the Jordan River that runs uh, lengthwise north and south uh, down the, the land. And so on the other side, that's where um, uh, Elijah went to hide out on the other side of the Jordan in a Kedereth, which is a brook. And so in that part of the world, we call it a wadi. Uh, in uh, South America, we call it an aurora, an abora. And so there really is just a dried up riverbed. So during the rainy season, these dried up riverbeds fill up with water. But then as it gets dry and as, as those waters evaporate, then it's just a dried up riverbed. And so uh, one of the things we say in geography that the most dangerous place in the desert is in those dried up riverbeds. One of the most, uh, one of the, the, the greatest causes of death in the desert is drowning. Because people go camp out in the desert they camp out on these nice little dry riverbeds and they say don't you should always find higher ground because you're in a you're in the desert you camp out on one of those river and those dried up riverbeds when a flash when a rain a quick uh, rain will come up in the desert and those little riverbeds will fill up because that's what holds water and so you can uh, you can certainly drown people get caught by surprise when a, a quick rain comes in the desert and those little wadis fill up if you've ever been out in the uh, the southwest part of the United States, and sometimes you've seen a quick rain come up, you'll see water, you're driving on the highway, you look on the side, you see those little, those little uh, wadis, those little uh, rivers, uh, fit, those little streams fill up. And so this is where uh, uh, Elijah is camping out and is hiding out in this brook, this little wadi riverbed, and eventually it will dry up, as we'll see. And then ravens uh, were, were commissioned to bring um, uh, Elijah food ravens were considered unclean animals. They're on the list of unclean animals. Somebody get the back door. Uh, they're on the list of uh, unclean animals by the Israelites. Um, and so uh, these ravens were commissioned to bring uh, Elijah food. Uh, they are the largest of the nesting uh, birds and they are scavengers. They'll eat anything. They are the largest of those nesting birds. Uh, ravens are are certainly uh, uh, some, some of the largest birds. So in the class with, with some of those owls and uh, uh, with eagles and with other scavenging birds. So ravens are the largest of those uh, scavenging birds. And so they, uh, and we talked about, they would normally, ravens would be not an animal that would bring food to you, but probably take food from you. Uh, and so uh, God has uh, those bring uh, food to Elijah two times a day. Uh, they brought him uh, in the morning and in the evening. They brought him meat and brought him bread. And then he had to get water uh, from the brook, right? And so these birds, uh, look up uh, ravens. They're scavengers. They eat anything. They'll eat, they eat, uh, they'll eat uh, some vegetation. They'll eat small animals and hunt and prey, livestock. They eat dead things. It says that uh, they're highly intelligent birds that 
that ravens will, will do a call uh, when there's like a large beast, a, a large carcass, they'll do a call that will summon wolves to come. And so when the wolves come with those large canines and wolves tear into the flesh, then the ravens are there to get in there. So they have these large beaks. The beaks are larger than their head. And so they use that as a hammer to, to crack and they can get into small animals. But with large carcasses, they, they make a call and wolves will come and do the dirty work form of tearing the carcass open and then they get their food out of it. So quite ingenious birds, some of the smartest birds from what I read, but these birds were, bring, were used to bring food to Elijah. And so all this is just showing how God was able to sustain Elijah uh, uh, during this time period. He was out by a brook and uh, had the ravens to bring him his food. But uh, eventually that brook, the drought persisted and the famine spread throughout Israel. Elijah's water supply is gonna dry up. And then the Lord directed him to travel 100 miles northwest to the Phoenician city of Zarephath. And uh, Zarephath was a center for Baal worship in Phoenicia. And Jezebel's father happened to be the ruler of that area, Zarephath. And so God used the widow to provide lodging and food for Elijah. So God is just, God will take you and hide you out in, in headquarters central for the Baal, the worship of Baal. Jezebel's father is the ruler of that area, but he'll take you and still hide you out right in the midst of, of your enemies. Well, but then we think about the 23rd Psalms. There he says, thou prepares a table. Where does he prepare the table? in the presence of your enemy. So right in front of your enemies, the Lord will feed you and sustain you and take care of you in the presence of your enemy. So he takes him and hides him out. Uh, what did he do with Moses? He took Moses and raised him up right in Pharaoh's house, used Pharaoh's money and Pharaoh's education to enrich and raise Moses up right in the house in the place that Moses is gonna later come back and, and tear down with the miracles and with everything that he's gonna to do to tear down Pharaoh and his house and then see Pharaoh and his army in uh, uh, Exodus what, 13, see them destroyed in the water. And Moses said, you'll see them no more. And, but, but this man was raised up right in their house. God will use your enemies. And I'm thinking about another incident, David. He said, the Lord said, David, you're not gonna build your house. I'm gonna let other people build your house. And so people from other places sent materials and sent workers in to build David's house. His enemies came and built his house for him. So the Lord can do anything. He can use your enemies to take care of you. He can use your enemies to enrich you. He can build you a feast right in the middle of your enemies. And so uh, he takes Elijah and sends him north up right into the place that's the headquarters for the worship of Baal. And then he has a woman who's a, 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 a Gentile, who's not a believer, but he has this woman be the one that's going to take care of him for a while. So that's up in Zarephath. All right. And after his time there, we're moving through this. After his time there, uh, God had told, at first, after he told uh, Ahab that it's not going to rain, he said, go hide. And then three years later, after his time in Zarephath, he said, go show yourself. Go show yourself. So it was time for, for Elijah to come out and to go show himself. For three years, Elijah had hidden himself at the brook Kedareth and with the widow in Zarephath. And we know the miracles that happened there. God had commanded Elijah to go hide yourself. And now three years later, God's command was go show yourself. By leaving public ministry, Elijah uh, created a second drought. There was a, already, he created the drought because of what he, his words he spoke created the drought of no rain, but Elijah being off the scene and not being around created a drought of God's word. No word of the Lord uh, during that time period because Elijah is gone. So there's nobody in Israel uh, bringing the word of the Lord uh, to Israel. So there was an absence of the word of God. And so now let's look at some, uh, some, 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 some references here. And so God's word. So now look at these, these ironies. Elijah comes and says, it's not going to be no rain, no rain, no moisture. That's a drought, no moisture on the ground. Elijah being away is a drought. There's no drought of God's word. Uh, but uh, let's look at it. God's word has been compared to rain. Let's go to Deuteronomy, back to Deuteronomy chapter 32. God's word has been compared to rain. Moses in uh, Deuteronomy chapter 32 and verse 2, I'll start at verse 1. Moses says, give ear, O ye heavens, and I will speak. 
and hear, O earth, the words of my mouth. Sounds like Isaiah, earth, earth, earth. Remember in Isaiah, all right? And then verse two, my doctrine shall drop as the rain. My speech shall distill as the dew, as the small rain upon the tender herb and as the showers upon the grass, because, the verse three, because I will publish the name of the Lord, ascribe ye, uh, ascribe ye greatness unto our God. So the Lord said, my, uh, Moses said that, the, that, that my doctrine shall drop as the rain. So this is a comparison. So look at the irony here. Elijah comes, there's no rain, no dew. Moses said God's word is like what? It's like rain and it's like dew. My speech shall distill as the dew, as the small rain upon the earth. So without the word of God, the word of God is that which sustains us, that which is uh, like rain. Let's go to Isaiah 55, that, that fantastic verse, fantastic chapter in Isaiah 55. In that section where Isaiah will say, seek the Lord in, in verse six, Isaiah 55 and six, seek the Lord where he, while he may be found, call upon him while he's here, let the wicked man forsake his ways. Now we drop down to verse 10. For as the rain cometh down and the snow from heaven and returneth not thither. So it comes down, it doesn't go back, it comes down, the rain comes down, the snow comes down, what does it do? It melts and it goes down into rivers and lakes and streams and the rivers and lakes and streams come down and feed lakes and rivers and then eventually uh, rivers and stuff flow back to larger bodies of water like oceans. Okay, so as the rain cometh down and the snow from heaven and returneth not nither, not thither, but watereth the earth and maketh it bring forth bud, bring forth and bud, that it may give seed to the sower and bread to the eater. So shall my word be that goeth forth out of my mouth, it shall not return unto me void, but it shall accomplish that which I please and shall prosper in the there and the thing whereunto I send it. Another reference, God's word is like water. It refreshes us. It's the thing that gives, brings water to the earth, just like the water comes and brings the earth. God's word is synonymous and, and acronym, synchronous to uh, rain from heaven. God's word comes out and water us and it feeds us and it nourishes us and it refreshes us. Brother Maxwell, I heard him, overheard him. He didn't think I heard him. He was in the auditorium talking about Saturday. He came home and didn't watch TV, but read the word of God. And he said it was refreshing to him. It, it refreshed him and revived him. That's what the word of God would do. It comes down like rain. And so we need it. But God, uh, with the, but as Elijah had created a drought, a drought of water and a drought of the word of the Lord, because the word of the Lord is essential to spiritual lives. It's refreshing. Only the Lord could give it. And the silence of God's, uh, uh, God's servants was a judgment from God on, uh, on Israel. Not to hear from God is to forfeit life itself. And you can see those references in Psalm 74 and not. No, they, I need to read those because I thought they were some, some good scriptures. What, Psalm 74 and 9. Psalm 74 and 9. Some good, some good verses that you should know. Psalm 74 and 9. Psalm 74 and verse 9. We see not our signs. There is no more any prophet, neither is there any among us, uh, any among us, uh, there are, is there among us any that knoweth how long. So this talks about, uh, about the absence of prophets and the word of God. Also Psalms uh, 28 and 1. Psalms 28 and 1. Psalms 28 and 1. Unto thee will I cry, O Lord, my rock, be not silent to me, lest if thou be silent to me, I become like them that go down into the pit. Hear the voice of my supplications when I cry unto thee. So we need the word of the God. And so with God holding his word back through Elijah and that silence was a, a judgment against those people that God would not even let Elijah uh, speak unto those people and give him the word. He withheld the rain and he withheld his word, two droughts. Elijah, on his way uh, to meet King Ahab, meets Obadiah, the prophet Obadiah, who is a steward and a, uh, in the, uh, was an administrator of the royal palace as well as a steward and supervisor of the King Ahab's estates. And so Obadiah uh, is, is, works for King Ahab. So Ahab and Obadiah, they go out during this time. There's a famine in the land. There's, there's a drought, less food. But Ahab, he's not worried about the people. 
Ahab's going out to foliage and look for grass and, and stuff that he can feed the animals, his horses and the mules, because he wants to keep the army strong in case there's an invasion. This is what he's thinking about. Ahab's thinking about keeping, the, keeping those animals fed so that the army can be strong, so that he can fend off attack in case there's an invasion. He's not worried about his people dying, that there's no been no rain and water. He's out looking for grass so he can feed the animals. So he's out, him and Obadiah, he goes one way, Obadiah goes the other way. The Lord leads Elijah to Obadiah and then tells Obadiah, go get your boss, the king, and tell him to meet me. Obadiah says, look, if I go get, Ahab been looking for you for three years, and he, and he ain't got, he don't have no time to wait. If I go tell him to come back and you're not here, he's going to get me. Elijah says, I'll be here. Just tell him to come back. I need to talk to him. So anyway, Obadiah is the minister of the royal palace. Uh, Obadiah doesn't stand out. So uh, check this out. Obadiah is in the palace. He's, uh, he's a prophet of the Lord. He's in the palace. And he's, you know, he's a key figure, but he's not out in front. So it reminds us a lot of times God's got people, his people sometimes in some different places. They may not be very present, very prominent, but they play key roles in God's story. So look at Esther. Esther kept it quiet of who she was until it was such a time as this, until Mordecai said, you got to go in there and speak up. You got to go and tell him that you, you a Jew and he's about to do is kill his people. So there's Esther. There's one example of somebody in a key place that's kind of kind of uh, 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 not very prominent until the right time. Look at two others in the New Testament. Look at uh, uh, Joseph of Arimathea and uh, look at um, uh, uh, John chapter three. You must be born of water and spirit. Uh, Nicodemus. So yeah, look at Nicodemus and Joseph of Arimathea. Two Jews, uh, 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 Nicodemus on the Sanhedrin, Joseph of Arimathea, very prominent man. They're there, but they play a key role because they're able to go and get the body of Christ and make sure it gets a decent burial. So two very prominent saints, uh, two very prominent believers of the Lord. So God has people at different places. They may not be very prominent, very open, but they're there and they play a role at the right time. So Obadiah is one of those. He's in, he's administrated in uh, Ahab's a court. He delivers the message uh, to tell Ahab to come and find Elijah so that he could give him the message. Everything Elijah did was according to the word of the Lord, including confronting Ahab and inviting him and the priest of Baal to a meeting on Mount Carmel. Ahab asked Elijah, uh, Ahab, when, uh, when he met Elijah, and uh, he asked him, Are thou uh, uh, are he, are thou he that trouble of Israel? So otherwise, are you the troublemaker? <laughs> you, you the troublemaker, one that troubles uh, uh, Israel? But it was Ahab's sins, really, that had caused the trouble. It, ain't it funny that some of the, that the people that cause the trouble think you the troublemaker? The people that cause the trouble, aren't they the ones that first say, try to accuse other people of being the troublemaker, but really they're the troublemaker? Uh, but let me tell you, Ahab's in good company. Ahab's in good company. Didn't, wasn't our Lord called the troublemaker? Jesus, he was called a troublemaker, Luke 23 and 5. They said he was a troublemaker. Uh, Apostle Paul, he's a troublemaker, didn't? Paul was in a different city, wasn't in a Thessalonica, and then the brothers came down from another city and, and said, hey, they're there that cause trouble. They're the ones that stirring up the trouble. And so Paul was called a troublemaker. So, Ahab, so uh, Elijah's in good trouble. Ahab said, are you the troublemaker that troubles Israel? Mark Carmel was located near the border of Israel and Phoenicia. So it's a good place for the Phoenician god Baal to meet Jehovah. So, hey, let's go have it at Mark Carmel. It's right on the border between Phoenicia, which practices the worship of Baal, and Israel. So, hey, it's a good place. Hey, it's a be convenient. You know, Baal can come right down because we're going to choose this spot that's right on the border to have this contest. Elijah told uh, Ahab to not only bring the 450 prophets of Baal, but uh, just for good measure, go ahead and bring the 400 prophets of Asherah, the idols that represent Baal's wife. So go ahead and bring them prophets too. But at the contest, only the prophets of Baal showed up uh, for the contest. Jehovah God prevailed over Baal. Elijah had announced three years before that his word, uh, that, that, that it was his word that stopped the rain and only his word could start it again. So we know that, on that, that, uh, that Elijah sat there and watched them guys you know, try to call on the bail and they start to cut themselves and Elijah egged them on like, where is he? Where, where's your guy? Is he in the bathroom? 
is your God asleep? I know what, where's your God at? And so these guys got more, you know, jacked up and cutting themselves and doing all kinds of things. And Elijah just watched. And then all of a sudden, okay, y'all through? All right, it's my turn. Okay. He gets repairs. I guess all the things they had did and kind of destroyed the area where they had to sacrifice. So he had to build it back up, uh, get the animal back on there, uh, dig a ditch. All right, let's dig a ditch around it. Okay, let's get uh, uh, 40 barrels of water three times and let's wet everything up. And then the water's in this ditch, so it kind of created the pool. And then we have the prayer that he, uh, that he, that, that, that Elijah uttered. And then guess what? Rain, I mean, the, the fire came down from heaven, consumed everything, licked up all the water, and then the rain came down. And so then the rain comes down, and so now there's a rush to get back to Jezreel. Uh, Ahab is trying to get in his chariot and get back to Jezreel. Here's Elijah. I don't know how old he is, but he's an older man. Elijah beats Ahab back to Jezreel. That's the, the, the power of God, that he carried Elijah, that he was able. He was on foot. He ran back and got to Jezreel before Ahab did. And Ahab uh, uh, was uh, leaving to get out of this rain to get back to Jezreel. God chastened his people with drought and famine, but had called, but had cared for his special servant, Elijah. God sent fire from heaven to prove that he was the true and uh, living God. He answered the prayer of his prophet and sent the rains to water the land. So now after three and a half years, here's the rains to water the land. Elijah should have been at his best spiritually and able to face anything, but we will see just the opposite. The psalmist wrote, every man at his best state is altogether uh, vanity, Psalm 39 and 5. Outstanding leaders in the scriptures with all their humanities knew how to find their way uh, out of the slump of despond and get back on track. And we can learn from their defeats and their successes. Uh, on Sunday, we've been studying the faith lessons of Abraham, and we studied some of the ups and downs Abraham went through. How quickly we can move from mountaintop of triumph to the valley of testing. We need to humble ourselves before the Lord and get ready for the trials that usually follow victory. After you have a victory, get ready for a trial. The, the, we see it happens, in, it happens, you know, we see sports, man, the team, they go out there, man, they just whoop somebody th uh, this week, man, like they stole something, man, they're great, they all high, guess what, you're going to lose next week. So they, how many times do you have it? Man, they have a great victory, man, they just stomp somebody good, and everybody's, the, all the sports cast, man, this is a great team, man, they're doing good, they're on a roll, and then they'll go out the next week, and a nobody team will just beat them like they stole something. What happened? Victory. You're on the mountaintop. Where are you going to go after that? Down in the valley. So it takes a lot to be able, after you come off that victory, don't get so high up. Don't celebrate just because you had that victory because the valley's coming. But the teams, they celebrate. They get so caught up in that. And so guess what? The next week when they should be practicing, they could, should be studying films. No, they're on TV doing interviews and talking to all the outlets, talking about how great this last game. That was last week. You got this week. Bill Belichick says on to Cleveland. He, forget about last week. Now, Bill Belichick epitomizes what Paul, forgetting what's behind, press forward to that which is ahead. Bill Belichick said, that was last week. We on to Cleveland this week. I ain't, and so you try to ask him about last week. I ain't talking about last week. That was last week. I got Cleveland this week. I got another game this week. So you never get too high uh, because you got something else. But uh, Eli uh, Elijah, we think he should be at his best. I mean, that was fantastic what he did. But uh, the valley came after that tremendous mountaintop experience. How quickly we can go from mountaintop to triumph of the valley uh, of testing. We need to humble ourselves before the Lord and get ready for the trials. Elijah was physically exhausted. He had lost his appetite. He was depressed about himself and his work and was uh, being controlled by self-pity. He says, I only am left. I, I'm the only one that's left. It's, it's just me. He isolated himself instead of seeking others. And worst of all, he wants to die. So when you're going through some things, that's the wrong time to isolate. Guess what? When we, we go through some trials, we want to just go in the room. We want to go in the closet. We want to put on some sad music and just we want to close the curtains. We want to show everything out. We don't want to see no sunlight. We don't want to see nothing happy. We don't want to eat no food. We don't want to do nothing. We just want to just, just drown in our sorrow and gloom. That's not going to do nothing for you. 
that's the time you need to be around people so you can be reconfirmed so people can tell you they love you that they care about you that you all right that yes you had a failure but it's okay but that's our that seems to be our, our mo that when we get into those times we we go down into the depths of self-pity and then we think you're the only one that's in it but when you talk to people and see that's why god gave us a church that's why we're supposed to talk to other people so other people say i've been there i've been i've done that that's happened to me. And you go, really? Yeah, that's happened to me. And so, the, and so that's why God wants us not to know that we're not alone. Other people have suffered what you've gone through. Other people have gone through what you've gone through. They suffered it. And then sometimes when you go and talk to other people, you say, man, I feel good about myself because they have gone through it worse than what you have done to more severe lengths. And so it can give you perspective. You can say, well, I'm not that bad. I'm, you know, and so, but sometimes when we get in the best, we look at ourselves, we think we're the worst, we're the worst, ain't nobody had it worse than us, we're, you know, we're the absolute worst, and that's uh, sometimes it's not true. But that happens when you isolate yourself. The Lord looks beyond our, our changing moods and impetus, uh, uh, impetuous prayers. He pities us the way parents pity uh, their discouraged children. Psalms uh, 103 and uh, verse 13 and 14, Psalms 103. The Lord pities us like, like, like our discouraged children. Don't, don't you remember when you got discouraged? Don't you remember how your mama uh, to come and, and cheer you up and, and when you got discouraged what, about something? Uh, what no, uh, there wasn't no other greater encourager than, than, than mothers sometimes. Mothers could just pick you up and make you, you, make you feel good. So Psalms uh, 103, verse 13 and 14. Like as a father pitieth his children, so the Lord pitieth them that fear him. For he knoweth our frame, he remembereth that we are dust. He knows our frame. He knows we're just dust. He knows we're just frail and, 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 and infall infallible creatures. The Lord knows it. He knows our frame. He knows who we are. And so he, pity, he has pity on us and he pities us. And so the psalmist, like a father, pitieth his children. The Lord has pity on us. And so we see here as, 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 as Elijah is going to sink into this depression here, uh, we're going to see some messages that are going to come to him. There are going to be some messages that will come. Uh, there's the enemy's message, the enemy's message. Uh, when the torrential rains began to fall, Jezebel was in Jezreel, and she may have thought, because she wasn't at Mount Carmel, she, she may have thought, oh, Baal the storm god done come through, and here's the rain from Baal the storm god. But guess what? Her husband Ahab got home. He let her know a different story. Uh, honey, you won't believe what Elijah did. He tore, and, and of course we know as wicked as Jezebel is, she was upset because Elijah came home and told that different story and uh, Ahab allowed her to do it. And he didn't, Ahab was weak. Ahab was a quitter, uh, but uh, Jezebel, she, 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 she decides, okay, I gotta do something about this. So Jezebel sent Elijah a letter. Now. Uh, he was right there at Jezreel. She could have sent soldiers and killed him. Because mm -mm. that, that, that display that he put on changed people's hearts. Because he not only did he take care of those sacrifices, did not only the fire come down and consume the sacrifices, the rain came, but then he took all those false prophets down and killed them. And so the people were like, Jehovah is Lord God. So the people are convinced they got he got their attention. So now if Jezebel goes and kills Elijah, she's going to make him a martyr. And so now people are going to really believe. So she's got to make uh, Elijah disappear. He needs to disappear. So then people after a while will just wonder what happened to Elijah. He'll be off the scene and then she can get people back into that false uh, worship. So Jezebel doesn't kill him. She didn't send soldiers. Uh, like Moses, uh, Elijah had brought fire from heaven, just like Moses. And also, like Moses, he, he had killed idolaters. Uh, uh, the people were waiting on Elijah to tell them what to do. And Jezebel does not want to make him a martyr so that the people will drift back into it, so that, so that people will worship God instead of drifting back into worshiping Baal. And her letter achieved its purpose. Elijah, in a moment of fear, forgot all the Lord had done in the past three years and took his servant, left Jezreel, headed to Beersheba in Judah. And then Elijah from there retreated, uh, and Elijah there retreats before a beaten enemy. His enemy was already beaten. 
The God had already beaten Jezebel. He was on his side. The Lord says, uh, uh, the New Testament, it, Paul would say, if God be for, uh, the Lord said, uh, Paul would say, if God be for us, who can be against us? Who was there to, and Peter would say, who was there to harm us if we zealous because that was good. She was already beaten. The thing is, Elijah didn't know she was beaten. Elijah got scared when she sent that letter. And, and you can go back in uh, chapter 19 and read. She says, I'm going to get you. I'm going to, I'm, you know, she's made a pledge that she was going to get him. That thing sent fear in, uh, in Elijah. And he picked up, he forgot everything. He forgot how God took care of him out at the brook of Kittereth, how the ravens fed him. He forgot how God took care of him up in, in Zarephath, where uh, he took him to a widow that hadn't have any food and, and, and sustained him and nourished him. He forgot all that, picked up his servant and ran out of fear. Retreated before a beaten enemy. So we get, that's the enemy's message, the message of danger, that she's going to kill him. Now, uh, 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 continuing with that message of danger, we, we ask, why flee to Judah? Why, Elijah, did you flee to Judah when Jehoram, who is the king of Judah, guess what? He's married to Ahab's daughter. And guess what? This girl is just as bad as her mama, Jezebel. Athila. Uh, in Kings uh, 8, 16, 19, you can read about her. Now, Athela, she would later take over and rule the land, and she's going to try to exterminate all of David's heirs to the throne. So she's, uh, she's just as wicked as her mama. But the two, the two uh, the northern and southern kingdom were tied together by marriage, by uh, Jehoah and Mary. They thought, they thought it was wise to tie the two kingdoms together to have, so they would have peace. So he's married to Ahab's daughter, Athela. And she's, she's bad news. The safest place for the child of God is the place dictated by the will of God. But Elijah did not stop to seek God's will. He was walking by sight, not by faith. He just picked up and ran. The safest place for you to be, even if you're amongst your enemies, is wherever God wants you to be. Wherever God has dictated for you to be, that's the safest place for you to be. I don't care if your enemies are around. I don't care if there's stuff and danger on either side. If God wants you there, that's the safest place for you to be. But Elijah picked up and he ran. He traveled almost 100 miles to Beersheba to drop off his servant. So he guess he says, hey, if they're coming for me, I want to get you out of the way. So his servant would be out of the way. Plus, and then he didn't tell his servant where he was going because hey, if they come and ask you, where is, uh, where is Elijah? I don't know. He just dropped me off here. So that he couldn't tell him where he was going. But Sheba is a city that was associated with Abraham. We know that back in the day, Abraham uh, lived in, in, in Beersheba. Uh, and so um, we find uh, that he would leave Beersheba and he would uh, go and sit under a juniper tree, a juniper with, where they would use the vines from this plant to, to bind up certain things. And so juniper means to bind. Elijah, Elijah sat down under the shade of this juniper tree and he prayed to the Lord to take his life. Lord, I just want to die. He prayed to the Lord to take his life. He said in his prayer, if you read it in, in, uh, in uh, 1 Kings 19, he was no better than his fathers. His uh, but who asked you to be better than your fathers? The Lord didn't ask you to be better than your fathers. All God asked him to do was to hear his word and obey it. That's what God asked him. He doesn't ask us to be better than our fathers. But see, Elijah is comparing himself uh, he had that self-pity, Lord, just take me. I want to die. I'm no better than my fathers. I failed. And God only asked him just to listen to my word and obey. Elijah suffering emotional burnout, weariness, hunger, and a deep sense of failure, plus a lack of faith in the Lord had brought Elijah into deep depression. Isaiah, Elijah is deeply depressed. Now we get the angel's message of grace. So while Elijah's there under the juniper tree and he's just weary, burnt out, he's done run 100 miles uh, down to Bathsheba. And so uh, when the heart is heavy and mind and body are weary, sometimes his best remedy is to sleep. So uh, Elijah's trying to get some sleep to try to uh, get some rest. While Elijah was asleep, God sent an angel to care for his needs. In the Hebrew word, in, Greek, in Hebrew and Greek, the word translated uh, angel also means messenger, so messenger from the Lord. Elijah and Peter were both awakened by uh, uh, angels. Elijah's awakened by an angel here. Remember Peter, when he was in prison, the angel of the Lord woke Peter up. And, and, and in fact, the angel of the Lord woke Peter up in jail and escorted him out, unharmed, escorted him right out to jail. 
and, and uh, set him free. And then he later on goes and runs to the house, knocks on the door, Rhoda comes and gets all excited, goes back to that's, that's in, uh, in Peter chapter 12. Elijah, uh, so uh, the angel woke up uh, uh, Elijah to get some nourishment, had uh, some water there, had some bread on the coals baked there for him. And so Elijah is, is able to get nourished and he goes back to, to sleep. Uh, the Lord knew Elijah was guess, was going on his way to Mount Sinai, one of the most sacred places uh, uh, in Jewish history. Uh, and Sinai was located 250 miles from Bathsheba. He's already gone 100 miles. And so now uh, uh, my, uh, Sinai, and he's going to go and go on the horror of Mount Sinai. He's just another 250 miles in, uh, from Bathsheba. And God was gracious to spread a table in the wilderness for his discouraged servant. Isaiah's discouraged. God spread a table and nourished him and fed him and said, you know, the angel woke him up a second time like, you need to eat because you need some nourishment for the journey you're about to go on. God knew where he was headed. God's ministries to Elijah parallel uh, Isaiah 40 and chapter 31. They that wait on the Lord shall renew their strength and amount up like eagles. Uh, he was hidden by God for three years, during which time he waited on the Lord. Those three years, he waited on the Lord till the Lord tell him, told him to go show himself. Uh, when he went to Mount Carmel, he was able to mount up with wings as eagles and triumph over the prophets of Baal. And Elijah prayed and it began to rain. The Lord strengthened him to run and not be weary. And now uh, he sustained him for 40 days so that he could walk and not faint. And so Elijah's going to walk uh, for 40 days to get down to Mount Sinai. We look at the creator's message and then we'll close out as we, as we look at this. Elijah's trip took 40 days. Uh, and we look at, look at that in terms of one day for every year the Israelites spent wandering in the wilderness after they were delivered from Egypt. It was Israel's unbelief at Kadesh Barnea. Remember when they didn't believe uh, that the Lord had prepared the land and that led to their judgment to wander in the wilderness in Numbers 13 and 14. And it was Elijah's unbelief and fear that led to his journey in the desert, those 40 days. The Lord also spent, so uh, 40 is a spiritual number. It's a time of testing. It's a test. It's a time of testing. So it's a spiritual number, and, it, and it's a time of testing. So the Lord spent 40 days in the wilderness when he was tempted of, the, of, the, of Satan in Matthew 4 and 2. Moses spent 40 days on the mountaintop with the Lord in Exodus 34 and 28. And Elijah had to deal with the Baal worship. Moses had to deal with the golden calf in Exodus 32. So we see those similarities uh, to these situations. But then for 40 days, that trip could have been made probably and maybe 10 days, you know, probably 10 days. But it's going to take 40 days for Elijah to make that trip. Elijah was so depressed that he was willing uh, to give up his calling and even his life. Elijah wants to die. He wants to give up the spiritual calling that God had called him to. He wants to die. That's how depressed Elijah was. When the Lord finally spoke to him, it wasn't to rebuke him, but it was to ask him a question. What are you doing here? Elijah, what are you doing here? I called you. Your work is couple hundred miles back up north. What are you doing here, Elijah? And that same message can be said to us. Sometimes we get into some despondence and get into some, some spots in our lives. And we have to say, and people somehow have to come by and say, what are you doing here? Why are you here? What, 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 why are you here? And, and especially for those who leave the faith and those that go outside, or those who stay away from the church, those who stay away from the fellowship, those who stay away, we have to ask you, what are you doing? This, this is what you've been called to. You have been called. You have been chosen. You've been set aside to come and to serve and, and to worship God and to give him glory. You've been called to be in the church and to fellowship and associate with the saints. What are you doing over here? What are you doing out of pocket? Uh, Elijah is out of pocket. He's out of line. He's out of the will. He's over someplace else when he's supposed to be up here. Remember uh, when Jonah was, was uh, going, supposed to go to Nineveh, and he's on his way down to where to, to Tarshish. And he's, he's going the other way. He's supposed to be going to Nineveh. He's supposed to be going to Syria. He's on a boat heading as far away as he's supposed to go. What are you doing? So the Lord, the word came to, to uh, Elijah. What are you doing here? Elijah's reply did not answer the question. You know, when, when you ask people questions, what are you doing here? Uh, uh, 
They never answer the question because there's no good answer for the question. There's no good answer for what you're doing here, why you're doing this. People don't answer question. They hem and they haul and they give you some half answer, but there's no good answer. Elijah's reply when God asked him what he was doing here did not answer the question. So God asked it again. What are you doing here? Elijah told the Lord. So now Elijah is going to rehearse this, this little scenario. Uh, I have been faithful servant, but if he was really faithful, what was he doing here in a cave? If you really faithful, why aren't you back up at your position, back up preaching to Israel and doing what God called you to do? Why are you here, Elijah? If you're faithful, but he says, I've been a faithful servant. A cave that was located hundreds of miles from his appointed place. Why are you here? In his reply, Elijah reveals both pride and self-pity and using the pronoun they. They have done this. What do other people say? They, and so you ask the question, who is they? Who, who, who is they? People always say they. Well, they did this. They did. Well, who is they? Who are they identifying? And so he asks, who is they? He exaggerates the size of the opposition. He makes, uh, 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 he makes it, I look as though, uh, makes it look as though that every last Jew of the Northern Kingdom had turned against him and the Lord. Actually, it was only Jezebel. Jezebel's the only one that threatened him. Jezebel's the one that threatened him, but in his mind, he's like, they, they this, they that. And so in, in other words, he thinks everybody's against him. Every, that everybody in Israel, that all of Israel was against them. It was Jezebel that sent you the letter, sent you in the field. But he said they. He, so he exaggerates the size of the opposition. The, the, the statement, I, am, I only am left refrain, makes it look as though he was indispensable when, uh, when a servant of God is not indispensable. So I'm the only one that's left. When has anybody of us been the only one that's left? But see, that, see, that's all despondency. That's all depression. That's all he's feeling. You isolate. You focus on them. It's they and it's me. Woe is me and it's they. And so he focused on him. I'm the only one that's left. I've been faithful and look at what's happened to me. I'm the only one that's left. God commanded him to stand on the mountain at the entrance of the cave, but it does not, uh, but, uh, it does not appear that Elijah obeyed him until he heard the still small voice. When the Lord passed by and reminded us of the experience of Moses, remember Moses? Moses said, show me thy way. I want to know. I don't want to just know, uh, show me, uh, Lord, thy way more. Show me, thy, show me thyself more perfectly. He just didn't want to know God's, uh, what, what God did. He didn't just didn't want to know his acts. He wanted to know his way. He wanted to be more intimately familiar with God. And so uh, the Lord God said, I'm going to take you. I'm going to put you on this mountain, and then I'm going to pass by. I'm going to pass by, but you're not going to see me. You're not going to see my face. You'll, you'll glimpse and see, the, see me as I pass by. You'll see the, the back of me as I go by because you, nobody can see God's face and live. So he, he hid Moses in the cleft of a rock, and then he passed by and allowed Moses just to get a glimpse of his glory as he went by. And so now Elijah is going to see some fantastic things. The Lord is going to cause a great wind uh, to pass by, one so strong that it broke the rocks and it tore the mountain. But the Lord is not in that. Then he's going to see a great, then he's going to feel a great earthquake. But the word of the Lord is not in the earthquake. It wasn't in the wind that broke the mountain. It's not in the earthquake. Then there's going to, the Lord brought fire. But the word of the Lord is not in that. The Lord used these displays to manifest himself to mankind, their theophanies to give mankind a manifestation of God's power, but, it's, but the power, but, it's, but the word of the Lord is not in those events. Mankind, for, since the beginning of man, has tried to understand the winds and understand earthquakes and understand all the physical and uh, ecological process of the earth and to subscribe something to God, but God is not in those things. God is in that still, small voice. Elijah stepped out of the cave and he met the Lord in a still small voice. What that's letting us know, God is not going to yell over the hurriedness and the, the hustle and bustle of your life. He's not going to yell at you. He's not going to come through you through some fantastic uh, earthquake and some fantastic cataclysmic. God's voice is going to be still and small. So that's telling us you're going to have to slow down to hear it. You're going to have to slow down 
You're going to have to get still. You're going to have to isolate yourself. You're going to not isolate yourself, but you're going to have to get quiet to hear the Lord. How much time do we spend in quiet reflection and repose? Brother Baxter talked about Moses had to go through some solitude. This is not less than isolation. This is just some solitude. You just need to get some time to get to yourself, just to get to know yourself, to know your own thoughts. You stay so busy. You stay so going. From the time you get up, you got thoughts. You got news running through your head. You got thoughts running through you from the time to get up to the time you go to bed. When do you ever spend some time in some quiet reflection, some quiet time to think, to sometimes to renew, to ruminate, and to, uh, to think about the word of God, think about what God has done to you, to look at the word and then let the word act on you and to, just to think about it and to clear out all the clutter and the hurriedness and hassle and bustle of your life so that God can talk to you through a still, small voice in his word. He ain't going to yell at you. God's not going to yell at you. He's not going to try to bang to get your attention. He's going to talk to you through a still, small voice. So you're going to have to, uh, uh, as the song says, humble yourself in the sight of the Lord, and he will lift you up. You're going to have to humble yourself. You're going to have to get down. You're going to have to abase yourself so that you can hear God talk to you. He ain't going to talk to you while you standing up, while you running around. You're going to have to get down. You're going to have to get humble. You're going to have to get low to the ground. You got to get down on your knees, abase yourself, empty yourself of everything so that you can actually hear what God is trying to tell you. People be wondering, uh, why ain't God telling me nothing? Because you won't slow down and let him tell you nothing. You won't be quiet long enough. You talk too much. Be quiet sometimes and listen and listen to what the word is telling you. Listen. Get quiet, get still, because God is not, he wasn't in those fantastic, there was an earthquake, there was a fire, there was wind blowing, there was these fantastic things, but the Bible says, and the word of the Lord was not in there, and the word of the Lord wasn't in there, and the word of the Lord wasn't in the earthquake, but the word of the Lord was still, and it was quiet, and Elijah had to get quiet to hear. I'm going to leave you there. In the cave with Elijah, we're going to come back and finish it. We're going to get him out the cave next week. Hope in the cave. You got to have some hope. Elijah's just pressed. He's down. He's out. Woe is me. They've been doing this. I've been faithful. But, Lord, look at where I'm at. I was faithful. Lord, I was doing all the right things. But then look at all of this. We're going to get him out the cave next week. We're going to, but right now, we're going to leave you with that still, quiet voice. Be still and know that I am God. Be still and know that I'm God. So we're going to leave you there. Man, this is a fantastic story. This is great. This is some just some great things in here. It's just much. I told Mike I ain't going to make it, so I, I knew I was going to make it. At least I got us in the cave. We're in the cave. We're down at Sinai. We're in the cave. And so then we'll come out of it, and we'll get us back up to where he has to go back to work. And there's some things that he's asked to do. Coming out of the cave, get back on the fence, Get back on the job. Let's get back on it. So this, this evening, for you, are you down? Are you depressed? COVID and presidential elections and, and civil unrest and public unrest and Black Lives Matter and police got us all down. The Lord says, you're not the only one. I got people like you all over the world. I got people. I got servants. I got people serving. Don't look at Trump. Don't look at Biden. I got people that are still serving God. I got people that still believe in me. I got people that are still my servants. Don't look at all of this other stuff. I still got people out there. I got people out there that still believe. I got people out there that are still trying, still serving. Great is he that is in you than he that is in the world. I got something greater for you. And that's what the Lord wants us to know. I got, yeah, there's some people out there, you ain't the only one. So quit singing that, woe is me. Stop that self-pity and all that and self-loathing and realize that God is still there with us that God is ruling in the affairs of man. He's, he's able to control and reach in through all of Corona and all this other stuff and still guide this universe and still guide his way. So no matter who we put on the, on, in the White House, no matter who we put in these different uh, public seats, because one day I want to tell you, all of them seats are going to come to nothing. The president's seat, all these Senate seats, they're going to come to naught. And all them people that are serving in them roles, they're going to be just like you and me, scrambling for the rocks and for the hills when the judgment comes, trying to get the rocks and the mountains to fall on them and hide them from the face of the Almighty God on Judgment Day. 
They may be big now. They might be braggadocious. They might be uh, big and bad at these debates, but one day they're going to all be, every knee will bow, and they're going to look up, and they're going to have to confess that he is Lord. And they're going to be looking for an outlet. They're going to be looking for some, uh, how can we get out? But there's no, there will be no deals to broker. There will be no deals to be made, no contracts to be made. Either you've been baptized into the watery grave of baptism and, and put on the white robes and be like John said, who are they? These are they who had their robes washed white in the blood of the lamb so if you don't have your robe washed in the blood of the lamb it's going to be too late on that day so my friend we just want to encourage you this evening that that you that still god is still there he's still calling us and we've got to stay on our job we've got to stay in our calling stay where god has placed us and that he's able to feed us he's able to nurse us he's able to take some weird circumstances and still sustain you he took some ravens some birds that don't usually do that and he fed uh, uh, elijah with some ravens he took him to to some foreign territory where there was, a, was no belief in god and sustained him with a widow who didn't even believe in god and sustained elijah so he can sustain you and me the psalmist says he prepares a table for us in the presence of our enemies he restored my soul surely goodness and mercy shall follow me so we want to leave you with that with that word that's a good word to see the brother maxwell that's a word that's some that's news made good that's not good news that's news made good and that's something you can use uh, uh, that help you get through this week so we're going to let you go at this time we appreciate you so much being here